Hello, welcome to St Andrews. Today is the closest Sunday to Anzac Day, which is tomorrow. A day when we remember the men of the Australian and New Zealand Army Corps who lost their lives at Gallipoli in the First World War, as well as all those who have been maimed and killed in armed conflict since that time. In little more than a hundred years, there have been two world wars and we are now dangerously close to a third. And the root cause of this chaos, violence and uncertainty is of course human sin and rebellion against God. But we need not fear because we know that Jesus is in control. In spite of what various world leaders might think, Jesus is an authority. Our theme today is all authority and our key verse is Matthew 28 verses 17 to 18. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we lament the fact that war and violence exist in this world that you have made. We lament the human sin, the pride, the folly, the greed, that creates so men much pain and the loss of life senselessly and we pray father for peace for peace in our world we pray that we will be peacemakers but right now we pray for peace in ukraine in europe in other parts of the world where there are various conflicts and fighting we pray for wisdom for world leaders we pray that people will look to you to be the ultimate authority, that we might learn from you and change our ways. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And our gospel reading is Matthew 28, 16 to 20. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is the Gospel of the Lord. So today we're thinking about authority. According to the dictionary, authority is the power or right to give orders, make decisions and enforce obedience. If no one had any authority, our society would literally fall apart. Uh, a general has authority to give orders. A company director has authority to make decisions. A judge has the authority to enforce obedience. And there's nothing wrong with any of that. The problems occur when a person bestows authority on themselves or when they abuse their authority or when they consider themselves to be the highest authority, accountable to no one. Uh, Vladimir Putin and his invasion of Ukraine has been dominating the headlines recently because he has done all three of those things. He's effectively bestowed authority on himself. Uh, Russian elections are far from democratic. He's abused his authority. 
and he considers himself to be the highest authority. It, it really seems uh, from all reports that he's making decisions in complete isolation. And the result of all this is a tragedy of epic proportions. When someone like Putin is in a position of authority at the top of the food chain, as it were, it has a huge impact on the con conduct of those whom they have authority over. Uh, the Russian soldiers who are committing atrocities in Ukraine, bombing civilian targets, conducting executions, raping and looting, those soldiers are responsible for their actions, no matter what their orders. But they have been given a license by those in authority over them. Uh, the uh, mindset and the morality rolls downhill from the top. Today, uh, on Anzac Day, we remember the First World War, uh, particularly Gallipoli, those who lost their lives there, and all the wars that have been fought since that time. War is surely always the result of someone in a position of authority, or in most cases, uh, quite a number of people in positions of authority making a series of very bad decisions. Authority is necessary, but in the wrong hands, it can unleash the most terrible evil. So what's the answer? What's the answer? Well, we need someone in authority, ultimate authority, who is entirely pure, just, good, righteous, loving, compassionate, and merciful. And praise God, there is such a person. His name, of course, is Jesus. On Easter Sunday, the women discovered the empty tomb, and the angel said to them, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the disciples, it said, went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. There is only one person in the history of the world who is worthy of our worship, and that's Jesus. But isn't it interesting to see that some of them had doubts? And when we read this account, it's tempting to think that there's two distinct groups here. Those who worshipped and those who had doubts. But no, there is only one group. There's a group of worshipping disciples, some of whom had doubts in their minds, some of whom had questions. You know, it's okay to come to worship with questions. The Christian journey is one of discovery, and we draw ever closer to Jesus and get to know him better. We won't have all the answers at once. In fact, in this life, we will never have all the answers. It's okay to have questions. It's okay to have doubts. After all, if you remove doubt from the equation altogether, well, then faith can't really be called faith, can it? So the disciples were worshipping the risen Jesus, and he said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now, we've already seen that human beings do have authority. Some exercise it well, others exercise it badly. No one exercises it perfectly. But human authority is always limited. I have authority over my children, but I don't have authority over all children everywhere. A CEO has authority over the employees in their company, but not over the employees of other companies. Human authority is always limited, and it's a very good thing that it is. Only Jesus has all authority. He has authority over all of creation, and we see that so clearly in the Gospels. Jesus taught with authority. People were always remarking that he taught with such authority. He commanded the winds and the waves to be still, and they were. He had authority to forgive sins. He healed people's diseases, not through medical intervention, but on the authority of his word. He cast out demons, demonstrating that he has all spiritual authority. He even has authority over death itself. 
evidenced by the fact that he rose from the grave. Jesus' authority is absolute. And the idea of someone having absolute authority can be quite terrifying. Unless that person is perfect and pure and good in every sense of the word. Unless that person also happens to be the only one who is worthy of our worship. In a world full of chaos and uncertainty, it's very reassuring to know that Jesus is in control. He's in charge. Jesus is in authority. Jesus has all authority, but he's not authoritarian. He prizes our freedom, even to the point that he will allow us to genuinely say no to him. But why would we want to do that? So Jesus is worthy of our worship. All authority belongs to him. We don't want to say no to Jesus. So the next question is, well, what does he ask of us? What does he ask of us? Well, at the end of Matthew's gospel, Jesus summarizes the mission of the church. It's often called the Great Commission. He said, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. Now, before we talk about making disciples, I want to state the obvious. Uh, Hopefully, we understand that in order to make disciples, we must first be disciples. If we want to be effective disciple makers, we need to be intentional about our own discipleship. Let me use Kids Church as an example. We've got a wonderful group of uh, mostly volunteers who invest in the lives of our children and young people. Now, the ideal scenario, and this is why we're always trying to expand the Kids Church team, the ideal scenario is that each team member will uh, serve perhaps one Sunday a month in Kids Church. And the other three or four Sundays, they'll be in here with us being taught and built up and encouraged and strengthened in their faith. Because then it's like they're drawing from a deep, full well that's being constantly replenished. If we're drying up spiritually, we can't water, we can't irrigate the spiritual lives of other people. If we want to be disciple makers, we must first take our own discipleship really seriously. We cannot feed others unless we ourselves are being fed. So what does Jesus tell us about making disciples? Well, the first thing he says is go. Go. And when we hear that word, especially as it's in the same sentence as all nations, we might think of the Apostle Paul and his missionary journeys, how he traveled throughout the whole of the known world preaching the gospel. Or bringing it closer to home. In our context, we might think of someone like Sandra, who recently returned to Indonesia to carry on the work of the Creating a Bright Future Foundation. And we think, well, I can't do that. I've got a job, I've got family, I've got responsibilities, I can't go off around the world telling people about Jesus. And that's fair enough. But in our context, go might mean go across the street and talk to your neighbor. Uh, Go out for coffee with one of the other parents from your children's school. Go and speak to that homeless person. Uh, Go and spend some time with a family member. Go. The word implies that we are to take the initiative with the intention of sharing the gospel at some point. Not necessarily straight away, but at some point. We must keep in mind that the Great Commission is the counterpart of the great commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you don't love the person, the chances are your attempts to share the gospel with them will fall on deaf ears. You may even alienate them. You may put them off. Love is the only legitimate motivation for sharing the gospel. So that's the first thing. We go. We take the initiative. We reach out to people in love. 
Next, we see that as a church, we are to baptize new believers in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We've got two baptisms next week. And uh, as a church, we take baptism really seriously. When, uh, when a family comes to me and they say, we'd like to have our uh, child baptized, I say, great. It's wonderful that you want to have your child baptized. So come to the church, get to know us, worship with us for a few months, and then we can start looking at setting a date for the baptism. Because when parents promise to raise their child or their children in the church, and when we promise to support them in that, which is what we do during a baptism service, I want to know that there's a, a, a reasonable chance that, well, I want to be as sure as I possibly can that that will actually happen. Baptism is a sacrament. It's an outward and physical sign of an inward and spiritual grace. In other words, it's a physical sign of what God is doing in a person's life. And we're going to talk about that more next week. So we go, we make disciples, we baptize them, and then we teach them to obey everything that Jesus has commanded. Uh, a very dear minister that uh, I used to spend time with used to say, well, uh, we, we catch the fish, but then we've got to clean them. And you might say, well, teaching is not my gift. Uh, but you know, the person who takes their own discipleship seriously will in invariably be surprised by the gifts that God gives them. So don't rule it out. Don't rule anything out. God can call you to absolutely anything. You'd be surprised. But even if teaching up here or in a home group or in kids' church, even if that's not your thing, it doesn't mean that you can't teach. The best way to teach all that Jesus commanded is by example, by living it out in our daily lives. Show people through your words and actions what it means to be a genuine follower of Jesus Christ. After all, the main aim of the Christian life is to become more like Jesus. Because if we're more like Jesus, well then we start to really have an impact in the world around us. Earlier I spoke about Putin and the fact that those over whom he has authority are likely to reflect his character, his intentions and his morality. It's in inevitable that that will happen. Uh, although it does seem that there's a lot of Russian soldiers who have refused to carry out illegal and immoral orders. So we don't want to tar everyone with the same brush. But if a person in authority is evil, it's not surprising that evil is perpetrated by their subordinates. Similarly, if we recognize the authority of Christ in our lives, we should expect to see Christ-like qualities developing and coming to the fore. Love, compassion, kindness, self-control, and so on. You know, one of the best ways to help with someone's discipleship is to be a loving friend to them. Because not only will they see what it means to obey Jesus' commands, but they will know that they are loved and valued. And if they know that, they'll want to keep coming to the church. They'll want to be involved in our community where they can be discipled in other ways too. If you can be a true friend to someone, if you can be a true friend to someone, you can play a big part in their discipleship. This is something for all of us. We go, we make disciples, we baptize, we teach. And in spite of everything that's been said, this may still sound really daunting. It's a big mission. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. So I, th I thought that was a crow outside. <laughs> I was looking. <laughs> There's some good sound effects there. I like it. Um, yeah, this is, this, is, this is massive, this mission that we've been given. But listen to the last words in Matthew's gospel. 
This is the very last thing in Matthew's Gospel. Jesus said, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. How encouraging is that? So Jesus gives us a commandment, but he also gives us a promise. We are to act under Jesus' authority, but we're not left to our own devices. I'm a big believer in children helping out at home from a very young age. But it needs to be supervised. You can't say to a three-year-old, right, here are some ingredients. Here's a food mixer. There's a cooker. Now make a cake. And then just go off and leave them to it. I mean, you you could do that, but it's got the potential to uh, go dangerously wrong. And at the very least, you're going to end up with a terrible mess all over the kitchen and a less than satisfactory cake. And if a responsible parent wouldn't leave their three-year-old alone to bake a cake, you can be absolutely certain that Jesus will not leave us on our own to accomplish a mission of such tremendous importance for the whole world. Although Jesus isn't physically here with us, he sends us his Holy Spirit. That is the Spirit of God living within each and every person who knows and loves Jesus. The Holy Spirit animates the church, bringing life and imbuing it with power. The Spirit provides comfort and guidance. And when we err, when we get it wrong, when we fall into sin, the Spirit convicts us and pulls us up short so that we can amend our ways. Jesus has conferred authority on us. Uh, He has called the church to finish the work that he began. The work of proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of heaven and salvation through the forgiveness of sins. And he promises to be with us always, always, empowering us by his Holy Spirit. The same Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead. Romans 8 verse 11 says, The Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you. The Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you. All authority belongs to Jesus. As Christians, we worship Jesus, we submit to his authority, we serve him. And what he asks to do collectively as a church is perfectly clear. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. And this mission may seem daunting. But if you can take your own discipleship seriously and you can be a loving friend to someone, then you have a big part to play in this mission. Let me say that again. This is crucial. If you can take your own discipleship really seriously and you can be a loving friend to someone, then you have a big part to play in this mission. And we must never forget that Jesus promises to be with us in that, even to the very end of the age. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do worship you. We, we accept your authority. We recognize you as Lord of our lives and of Lord of all creation. And we pray that each one of us will see the part that we can play in this great commission, in this mission of making disciples. Help us to recognize that this is not unachievable, that every one of us can can be a part of this. And we pray that we will, each of us, actively seek to get to know you better and to grow in our own Christian life so that we might reach out to others in love and tell them the wonderful news that we can be forgiven and given eternal life by your son Jesus. And we pray all this in his name. Amen. This Anzac Day, we are reminded of those within our congregation who have directly or indirectly been affected by the war efforts many serving in overseas conflicts.
For those military men and women, we honour you and say thank you. Please bow our heads as we pray. Heavenly Father, as the sun rises this day as it did on the first Anzac Day, help us to remember the sacrifice of the first Anzacs and the generations of men, women and children who have died for the cause of liberty and peace. We pray for those who still bear the physical and mental scars and disabilities of their service. We pray for all who suffer from the effects of war. Grant them your peace and your healing strength. For those who in sadness recall lives lost, grant them comfort in the hope of the resurrection. In the spirit of your rising son of Anzac, grant us your hope and healing. Lord God, help us to remember the widows and the widowers, parents and orphans, sisters and brothers, and all who waited in vain for the return of a loved one. Help us remember the mateship, the agony, the courage and compassion of their war service. In the spirit of your rising son of Anzac, grant us your courage. Lord God, save us from glorifying the horror and tragedy of war. Instead, help us find the bravery that empowered them in the suffering of those who endured. Have mercy on our broken and divided world. In this day, we pray for the innocent people in the Russia and Ukraine conflict. May their lives be restored and justice be delivered to those in power to cease all intentions. May you rebuild your kingdom in these fallen nations with grace and that they abide in the spirit of power, love, rest and self-control. In the spirit of your rising son of Anzac, grant us your strength. Lord God, may we be inspired by the determination of those who have served in the fight, those young, those old, men and women, for freedom, justice and peace. Loving Father, remove from them the spirit that makes for war, that all may live as members of your family and that we love one another in the humility of your Son, Jesus Christ. In the spirit of your rising Son of Anzac, grant us your faith. Loving Father, who gives life to all, may we always see your goodness by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and be reminded that Jesus will always be our King of Kings, which we surrender freely all authority in our lives so that we may be transformed by the renewal of our minds. May you grant us your peace as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.